This video is for ELEC 1510 Logic Design. This is Lecture 22, Video 1 on Ripple Counters, corresponding to Textbook Section 6.3. Alright, so let's look at the operation of a very basic ripple counter. This is made up of four T flip-flops, as you can see. I'll number them, flip-flop 0, 1, 2, and 3. And so the way that this works is that in sort of an odd design, the outputs from the flip-flops are connected to the clock inputs of the next flip-flops sort of in order. Uh, the only clock input that is not coming from another flip-flop is the count wire here that is the clock input to T flip-flop zero. All of the toggle inputs are held at a logical one, so that just means high level. And as you know from learning about how T flip-flops work, when the input to the T wire for a flip-flop is a one, that means that every time you see either a rising or a falling edge, the output is going to toggle. There's also a reset line here that will just reset the count, um, reset all of the outputs to zero. So that can be used as well. Uh, we don't normally use those in designs, but it does make the implementation of the ripple counter a little more flexible in how it behaves. All right, so let's analyze this, how it's going to work. What's really important here is the inverted clock inputs. So let's say that we have originally 0, 0, 0, 0 at all of the outputs from the flip-flops. Now, let's say that we have a rising edge at the count. Well, as you can see right here, we have an inverter on the clock, so that doesn't produce a difference at the output. So we then need a subsequent falling edge in order to produce a rising edge at the output and get a 1. But then this is fed into the inverted input to the clock for flip-flop number one, which doesn't produce anything because it's inverted. We need a falling edge. Okay, so then let's say that we get another rising edge, which doesn't do anything, and then a falling edge. And then at the output from flip-flop zero, we get a falling edge, and it becomes a zero. And then that triggers this clock, which now toggles the output, and now we get a rising edge to a 1. Okay, so that's an input here, which doesn't do anything. So we need to now work through a couple more clock cycles. So with two more falling edges on the count wire, we'll eventually get a rising edge and then a falling edge, which then will change this line into a falling edge to 0, and then we'll get a rising edge to a 1 right here. And so basically this is just counting up. With every falling edge on the count wire, you get an increase in basically the binary count of the state of the four flip-flops. So before we did anything, we had 0, 0, 0, 0. And then after one falling edge, we had 0, 0, 0, 1. After two falling edges, we have 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on for the rest of the states. And this will just keep going until the whole system resets. So while designing a counter that counts up in binary is nice, it's not exactly that practical because we work in decimal numbers rather than binary numbers. So if you wanted to make a clock, for example, that counted from you know, 0 to 9 and then uh, stop there and then would start over from 0 like we're used to in binary numbers, you would instead want to make a BCD ripple counter, so binary coded decimal rip ripple counter. So this type of counter uh, cycles through these states, first 0, 0, 0, 0 for BCD number 0, all the way through 1, 0, 0, 1 for BCD number 9, and then it starts over from 0. So we need to design a different type of ripple counter that moves instead from state 1001 to 1010 like it would in a normal ripple counter. We want to get rid of that and have it move to state 0000. One implementation of a BCD ripple counter looks like this. 
I'm not going to go through the whole derivation of this because it's pretty complicated. Uh, but this is an implementation that will actually produce the BCD count. Now you can see that this one uses JK flip-flops and we'll call these 1, 2, 4, and 8 for the places in the binary numbers. Now as you can see, a logic 1 is the input to J1 and K1 which means that that Q1 always toggles. The input to J2 is actually, as you can see, if we trace this down here, is Q8 prime. And then the input to K1 is 1. So Q8 prime normally is a zero, which means that J2 is, or I'm sorry, Q8 is a zero, which means Q8 prime is a one, which means that Q2 is often going to be toggling unless Q8 is a one, then J2 is a 0 and K1 is a 1, which means that we reset that output. J4 and K4 are both going to be a 1, which means that Q4 is going to always toggle. J8 is going to be, as you can see from the AND gate here, Q2 and Q4. So it's going to be a zero unless both of those are one. K1 is always a one. So that means that Q8 is always at reset state until Q2 and Q4 are one and then Q8 toggles. So this in combination with the connections to the clocks is what actually produces um, the BCD counter. So the clock connections are a little bit interesting as well. The Q1 output is the clock for JK flip-flop number two and JK flip-flop number eight. And then Q2 is the clock for JK flip-flop 4. The counter is the clock for the first one. So again, the derivation of this is fairly complicated, but this set of inputs and clocks is going to produce the BCD ripple counter. So one of the homework assignments is going to be to simulate this circuit by designing it in Quartus and then making sure that it actually outputs the BCD ripple count.